Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jack Welch, I'm a professor of astronomy and EECS, and a member of the Hitchcock Professorship Committee. And we're pleased, along with the Graduate Council, to pre present Professor Alexander Delgarno, this year's speaker in the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Lecture Series. Now, as a condition of this bequest, we're obligated and actually quite pleased to tell you how the endowment came to UC Berkeley. It's a story that exemplifies the many ways this campus is linked to the history of California and the Bay Area. <clears throat> Dr. Charles Hitch Hitchcock, a physician for the Army, came to San Francisco during the gold rush where he opened a thriving private practice. In 1885, Charles established a professorship here at Berkeley as an expression of his long-held interest in education. His daughter, Lily Hitchcock Coit, still treasured in San Francisco for her colorful personality as well as her generosity, greatly expanded her father's original gift to establish a professorship at UC Berkeley, making it possible for us to present a series of lectures. <clears throat> the Hitchcock Fund has become one of the most cherished endowments of the University of California, recognizing the highest distinction of scholarly achievement. Uh, thank you, Lily and Charles, and uh, now let me go on with the introduction of uh, Professor Delgarno. As a distinguished astronomer, Professor Delgarno's achievements have been notable. He's renowned for his groundbreaking research in atomic, molecular, chemical, and dynamical processes in astrophysical and atmospheric environments. He actively studies theoretical atomic and molecular physics, astrophysics, and neuronomy, the study of the upper atmosphere. Professor Delgarno received his B.S. in mathematics with first class honors in 1947 and uh, in 1948 a B.S. in advanced subjects with distinction and his Ph.D. in theoretical physics in 1951, all from University College London. From 1951 through 1967, he rose from assistant lecturer to professor at the Queen's University in Belfast. And then he joined the Department of Astronomy at Harvard University in 1967. <clears throat> Professor Delgarno is author of more than 600 publications, and this is an enormously prolific activity, <clears throat> particularly if one re realizes that during the last three decades he's been the uh, uh, letters editor for the Astrophysical Journal, which is the, the, kind of the main journal for astronomers in the U.S. He's received numerous awards, including the John A. Fleming Medal of the American Geophysical Union, the Hughes Medal of the Royal Society, and in 1998, <clears throat> quite appropriately, the asteroid designated 6941 was named Asteroid Delgarno. I say appropriate in view of what he'll be talking about today. Professor Delgarno is currently the Phillips Professor of Astronomy at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and a physicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Please join me in welcoming Professor Alexander Delgarno. Well, let me again express my uh, appreciation for the invitation to deliver the Hitchcock uh, lectures this, this year, and I'm going to talk about comets and the solar wind, and re relate it, uh, embed it in molecular astrophysics. <clears throat> now in ancient times, comets were regarded as uh, threatening objects, which would appear in the sky out of nowhere and move through the heavens before departing as mysteriously as they had arrived. They were feared as bearings of ill tidings, portents of disaster.
Uh, the Greek astronomer Ptolemy made a list of the possible catastrophes and associated them with uh, particular descriptions of comets. And in Homer's Iliad, one finds the helmet of Achilles shone like the red star that from his flaming hair shakes down disease, pestilence, and war. And the flaming hair refers to the tail that comets, uh, all comets have. At later times, they were seen as more um, benevolent, even celebratory. And one finds in, uh, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, the doublet, uh, it's actually spoken by, by Caesar's wife. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blazed forth the death of princes. And in 1305, in a painting of the Epiphany, Giotto portrayed the visit of the three wise men from the east with a comet above their heads in place of the Star of Bethlehem. Two bright comets uh, had appeared in 1301 and 1302. Uh, one of them, the comet that became known as Halley's Comet, some 400 years later. You probably know that Halley never saw his comet. It was named for him because he predicted its appearance, uh, which actually occurred after, after his death. Halley's Comet uh, is, uh, <coughs> is shown, shown here. I'm not sure how clear it is for you to, to see it, but there it is, and uh, it uh, clearly has, has, uh, has a tail. It's rather a nice painting, isn't it? The uh, Halley's Comet also uh, appears in the Bayeux Tapestry. Rather less elegant. There it is. That's Halley's Comet. It appeared um, uh, <coughs> at the time of the Norman invasion of England in 1066. And the comet actually presided over the defeat of Harold at the time of the Battle of Hastings. Giotto's rendition of the comet was accurate in showing the comet tail. All comets have tails, and, and the tails all point away from the sun. And this uh, ancient belief that uh, comets were heralds of disease has actually received support from two well-known astronomers, uh, Fred Hoyle and um, Chandra Wick Ramasinghe, who in 1979 wrote a book with the title Diseases from Space. And in it, they, they argued that the Black Death, which is another name for the bubonic plague, which reappeared on Earth after an apparent absence of 800 years, and which ravaged Europe in the years between 1348 and 1350. They uh, suggest it was carried to Earth by comets. And their thesis is given some credence in, in a recent book, uh, just published last year by Norman Cantor, called In the Wake of the Plague. Uh, he uh, accepts uh, substantially the, the arguments they put forward. However, leaving aside the plausibility of comet-borne viruses as sources of disease, there are indeed persuasive arguments that the water on planet Earth came at least in part from a, from a literal rain of comets. Comets are composed mostly of water, occurring in the early active stages of the, of the uh, solar system. And it's been proposed that the organic molecules necessary for life to begin did not originate to in, uh, on Earth. They were brought to Earth uh, at that time by, by the comets. Organic molecules have indeed been found in comets and in meteorites. And the chemical composition does give evidence of an origin in interstellar clouds. We believe that comets are the, deb the debris left after the formation of the planets and that they are therefore witnesses to the form formation of the solar system and they're containing information about the nature of the interstellar medium five billion years ago uh, before the sun came into existence. Now there are two uh, distinct populations of comets. There are long period comets. We have periods perhaps in excess of say 200 years and they live in the Oort cloud uh, which is a, a cloud uh, uh, which is located on the, on, the, on the very edge of the solar system, beyond the planets, at a distance from the sun of more than 20,000 astronomical units. 
An astronomical unit is the Earth's sun distance. It's about 150 million uh, kilometers. The short period comets, by definition, visit us more often. And they reside in what is called the Kuiper Belt, which is a disk-shaped region near the planet Neptune at a distance of 30 or so astronomical units. The Kuiper Belt is home also to a variety of asteroids and other solid bodies, uh, many of which may be dead comets that have lost uh, their uh, reservoirs of gas. Now, comets are perturbed from time to time, perhaps by a passing star, and may be injected into orbits that bring them close to, to the sun, which is where we see them. The comets are icy conglomerates of refractory materials. They have nuclei, which are several kilometers in extent. And as a comet uh, approaches the sun, its surface is heated uh, by the uh, uh, radiation from the sun. The ice sublimes, and the gas flows away from the nucleus, dragging dust with it. And the flowing gas creates an atmosphere around the nucleus, which reaches out to a million kilometers or more. So comets are very large objects, by far the largest in the solar system. The gas flowing away from the nucleus, as the ice sublimes and the gas flows away from the nucleus, it drags the dust with it, and the dust forms an extended tail, pushed away from the sun by the uh, pressure of the radiation from the sun. And as the comet moves around the sun, the dust tail tends to lag, lag behind. So here's a photograph of comet uh, Hale, Hale Bop. See, it has the elongated shape and the tail that Giotto ha had, had painted. It's a dramatic example of uh, perspective in a, in a painting. And here's uh, another example of a comet. Comet Haya Kutaki, and that has uh, multiple tails. Comets uh, are usually named after their discoverers, who are most often expert amateurs, with a detailed familiarity with the sky, able to quickly identify new objects. Now we see the tail because the dust in the tail reflects the sunlight. Now the gas flowing off the comet nucleus also responds to the solar radiation, and it's a process called fluorescence, which I'm going to try to explain to you. See, the atoms and molecules of, of the gas can absorb radiation. And atoms and molecules have uh, specific uh, levels, actually energy levels, in which they can reside. In this uh, picture I show three such levels, and label them E0, E1, and, and E2. But atoms and molecules have, have many more levels. Now these energy levels can be populated by absorbing radiation from the sun. And they absorb radiation at, at specific, of a specific color, or you could equally well say a specific energy or a specific wavelength, the equivalent statements. And so this system could absorb a photon and go from level E0 to level E1. And then level E1 can be depopulated by spontaneously emitting radiation, either at the same energy or wavelength or color as the absorbing, photon, uh, absorbing radiation. That's simply A1 coming back down to E0, or by a more elaborate process giving rise to actually two pieces of radiation, which are called photons, two photons of different wavelengths, different energies, the sum of which, of course, equals the difference between E1 and E0. So it's possible to have a fluorescence process in which one absorbs into, into this level, emits into this level, and then emits again in, back down to where one started.
Now, wavelength, let me emphasize, is just a more precise way of indicating the color of a radiating object. The, the sun is yellow. Yellow is a shorter wavelength than red. Wavelengths are useful because they remain so at, at uh, wavelengths at energies beyond the, vis the visible. We need special instruments to measure radiation at ultraviolet and, and X-ray wavelengths. These are just emissions of greater energy than the, than the visible light that we can see. And there's a remarkable property. The wavelengths are characteristic of the atom or molecule involved, and they serve to uniquely identify it. It's a remarkable fact, I think, that given the wavelengths or color of an emitting or absorbing species, the, the atom or molecule responsible can be uniquely identified. You can say what that atom is, what is that molecule, simply by looking, by measuring the wavelength of the emission or the absorption. And we can also tell whether the atom is neutral or not, whether the atom or molecule is neutral, or possibly it has lost an electron and become a positive ion, it may have absorbed radiation from the sun, energetic enough to knock out an electron. It becomes a positive ion, and we can, we can tell uh, simply by looking at the absorption or emission uh, uh, features to which that uh, system gives rise. And actually, we may also be able to determine the velocity of the emitting or absorbing uh, system. And despite the observation of emission features, of this kind that the material out of which uh, remote objects are, are formed uh, can be determined, and particularly the material out of which comets are made. There's the possibility of confusion if the instruments used do not have sufficient uh, resolution. So they may, in fact, be, uh, see uh, overlapping lines and be unable to d distinguish between them. So one does require high resolution. With low resolution, and that depends on the instruments one is using, uh, the, uh, the features can overlap. Now here's an example of, what I, uh, of the emission of a particular comet. It shows the emission strength as a function actually of wavelength. This kind of representation is called a spectrum. Just so you can see it, you can just regard it as a variation in color and showing the, uh, the uh, relative intensities of the different, uh, the different colors. This, uh, these features establish unequivocally the presence of, of molecular hydrogen. That's that, that feature there. If you see that feature, if you see it anywhere, looking to any object, you know that molecular hydrogen is present in the object. You can confirm your belief by looking at it here, too. Here's another feature, which again is due to this hydrogen molecule, which I labeled here as H2. And this, this, is, this feature here tells you carbon monoxide is present. And you can confirm it, but here it is again. This feature is also due to carbon monoxide. And this one is atomic oxygen, the oxygen atom. Just by observing that feature, you can say, yes, atomic oxygen is present in the atmosphere of this uh, particular comet. And what is also a great uh, current interest is that there are unidentified features here. There are lines in the spectrum, features in the spectrum, and we do not yet know to what, they, to what system they belong. Now, other features, not on this particular uh, spectrum, but other features in the radiation emitted by comets show that uh, positive ions are present in the cometary gas. And the gas flowing off from the dust is, is neutral material, but it is actually being ionized by the radiation from the sun, knocking out an electron, creating a positive ion. And we actually see those positive ions in the cometary gas. And those ions form a distinct tail, which, unlike the dust, is a straight linear extension of the line joining the comet to the sun. The dust you now lagged behind and was sort of curving away as the comet moved around the sun. But these, this, this tail created by the ions, also called a plasma tail, does not. It uh, tends to be seen in the blue. The uh, energetics are such that uh, the transitions to which it gives rise are in, in the blue part of the spectrum. 
Um, I'm not actually entirely convinced that that is what it is, but it's, uh, it, there is blue and it is uh, certainly uh, a straight line. What happens is the magnetic field wraps around the comet and entrains the, uh, uh, entrains the ions. So the question is, what is responsible for, for this, uh, for this uh, plasma tail? It clearly has something to do with the sun, because it's pointing directly away from the sun. The sun is pushing it away in some, in some, by some mechanism. And it was the existence of these cometary ion tails that led to the idea that the sun continuously emits a stream of ionized particles, which, because they're positively charged, interact strongly and selectively with the positive ions in the cometary gas. So the sun's radiation, the light from the sun, creates the ions, and then something else from the sun pushes them away. There's a stream of ionized particles pushing away the, ionized, the positively ionized components of the cometary gas. So the sun is made mostly of hydrogen and helium, and if you ionize them, the corresponding ions are called protons and, and alpha particles. And these protons and alpha particles, as they are moving out from the sun, they sweep up the positive ions in the cometary atmosphere, and they carry them outwards away from the sun. And this outward flow of material from the sun constitutes the solar wind. And it's how the solar wind was, was first uh, discovered, was by the, in the interpretation of these uh, cometary uh, observations. Now recently, an unexpected uh, uh, discovery was made about comets. They emit x-rays. Now x-rays are, uh, are very energetic. The comets are cold and uh, I see conglomerates. Right? So how, how could something like a comet possibly generate x-rays? Well, they do, apparently. Now, extensive observations of comets had been carried out at, at visible and, and ultraviolet wavelengths. But because the sun is a weak source of x-rays, we know from, from measurements, the sun is a weak source of x-rays. And in principle, of course, you can take an x-ray and you can reflect it. So perhaps the x-rays we're seeing from comets are just reflections of the solar x-rays. But reflection of an x-ray is a very inefficient process. X-rays tend to be absorbed. They don't reflect very, uh, very well. And the solar x-ray flux is, in any case, is very weak. So the x-ray um, suggestion that it's just reflected x-rays uh, fails. And because uh, it was expected uh, to fail, no one thought uh, to look in the X-ray region of the spectrum. The comets may have been emitting X-rays, but no one expected it, so no one observed it. X-ray observations, of course, are difficult to make. They require a telescope in space, where on which observing time is always uh, at a premium. And cometary observations also require the capability to track a rapidly moving object, not just sitting looking at a star. It's a comet and it's moving. And so it came as a great surprise when the German X-ray satellite ROSAT happened just by chance to include comet uh, Hayakutaki in the field of view of its telescope. Comet Hayakutaki, they discovered, was a strong source of x-rays. They then searched their uh, accumulated uh, archival database, and they found five more comets. Uh, they had, in fact, observed them earlier without, uh, without realizing it. So this discovery that comets are sources of energetic phenomena that uh, produce x-rays promises to tell us something new and significant about comets beyond our present understanding 
uh, if we can uh, assemble some uh, interpretation of the uh, emission of the X-rays. Now we have, uh, the, so that initiated a, a search, uh, and the first thing done was to create an image uh, in, a, in the X-ray region, just a picture. Asked well, what would it look like if you took a picture in X-rays? And here is what it looks like. You see the shape uh, is entirely different from the shape in the visible. You remember well, the previous uh, transparency and also the uh, uh, comet Hale-Bopp. It's, uh, or oh, the, the painting by Jotter. It's entirely different in, uh, in, uh, in its uh, shape. There's no tail. There's a crescent. The crescent, though, is peaked in the, in the direction of the sun. So that's an indication that something is happening that is connected to the sun, but it's very, it would seem to be very different from the plasma tail or from the, uh, from the dust uh, tail. Well, then a, a spectrum was, uh, was obtained. Frankly, I have to be a little technical here. Uh, what this shows is the, uh, this was Comet Levy, and it shows the uh, emission strength in the X-ray region from uh, two, 200, uh, well, 100 electron volts to uh, uh, 2,000 electron volts. X-rays, when one talks of X-rays, one usually uses as a unit um, energy uh, in, in what are called electron volts. So we're simply increasing in energy from, uh, from 100 electron volts to, uh, to 2,000 uh, electron volts. And looking at the strength of the, of the emission. So it's a spectrum in the X-ray region, in electron volts. Now the crosses are the experiment. Are the, the crosses are the experimental measurements. Those are the experimental data. Are those are those crosses. I should emphasize this is a low-resolution experiment. Something are probably as large as, say, two, 200 electron volts. So when you're looking at any particular energy, there's a spread of two, as much as 200 electron volts. So it's possible, even though this seems to be sort of smooth and there's a smooth curve through it, it's possible there are features uh, underneath uh, which have been submerged by the low resolution of the observations. If one ignores that possibility, what this show, what A shows, is the known spectrum of a process called bremsstrahlung. That is uh, actually collisions between uh, electrons and positive ions which actually generate uh, uh, radiation in the X-ray region if it's hot enough. If you take a temperature of say two and a half million degrees, then uh, bremsstrahlung gives rise to this smooth curve A. Now if I now multiply this by the experimental sensitivity, which varies as a function of energy, what I would get is this smooth curve here. So Bremsstrahlung is a smooth curve. This is the Bremsstrahlung modified by the instrumental sensitivity. And you see it's a beautiful fit. It goes through all the points. So the natural conclusion is that this is a, indeed is Bremsstrahlung. The temperature is two and a half million degrees. And the problem that faces us is how to explain that we have a plasma of that uh, temperature in the neighborhood of the comet. Well, fortunately, there was a, another measurement with a slightly or remarkably better uh, resolution, not of the same comet, but looking again in the X-ray region. And this is what uh, they saw. The comet, actually a very interesting comet, which broke up before and after the, uh, the observation. And you see it's, it's the same energy range from 200 electron volts to an hour, actually half the energy range, this is one kV. You see right here, there's actually a, a, big, uh, a big peak. There's another feature there, it would seem. And then after the breakup, this is mostly noise, but it's still there. And this, for some reason, seems more pronounced. But in any case, you know, this is clearly not Bremsstrahlung. 
Ren Shaolin would be uh, is smooth. If I take the, uh, the resolution capability of the previous instrument that looked at Comet Levy and, and feed in this spectrum, I do get something that looks like Brem Strahlung. So the Brem Strahlung interpretation was, uh, though it seemed a very powerful one, uh, is consistent with this spectrum, simply because of the lower resolution. Well, now, what is it? It has something to do with the solar wind. We know that. The peak, uh, the peak in the image was always points to towards, um, uh, towards, uh, towards the sun. It's not radiation. We've excluded that possibility. It's, it's, the only thing left is the solar wind itself. Now, the solar wind though it's mostly protons and um, alpha particles, you know, from the hydrogen and the helium, the major components of the sun. But it, uh, the solar wind also contains a certain amount of heavy elements. You know, we know that from looking at the solar corona, which is a very hot gas around the sun. It contains things like oxygen and nitrogen and carbon, with uh, most of their electrons removed. So it contains multiply charged uh, heavy, heavy ions. They're minor components, but they're certainly present. And indeed, it's not merely theoretical speculation that they're present. They have been on occasion detected by in situ instrumentation on spacecraft. So these heavy ions are carried along with the protons and the alpha particles, certainly. And what, what do they do? They collide with the cometary atmosphere. So and when, when a multiply charged system collides with a neutral gas, which is mostly what the cometary atmospheres are made of. And the ions, they prefer to be neutral. They'd rather not be uh, ionic. They're only ionic in very hot gases or when they're subjected to intense radiation. An ion by itself, as it were, would much rather be neutral. So they will capture the electrons. They will capture electrons. I take, say, an oxygen atom with no electrons. Oxygen is said to be eight plus, eight electrons have been removed. It will collide with one of the atoms and molecules of the, of the cometary atmosphere. It'll capture an electron. It'll take an electron away from the neutral gas and produce, in the case of oxygen 8 plus, becomes oxygen 7 plus. It captures an electron, now has one electron. Now, that one electron will be in some high energy level of, of the ion. It'll be, it, it will be preferentially captured uh, into a high energy level of the ion. So it's now sitting up there. And, in some high energy level, and it's going to radiate. And of course, it will radiate in the, in the X-ray region. So that is the process. Surely that is the process which is giving rise to, to the X-ray spectrum. It is a, a consequence of the solar wind. And the energetics are right. Uh, the ions will emit in the X-ray uh, region of the spectrum. Now, as they radiate, they can cascade to other levels. They can make their way down back to the ground state of the system in a variety of paths, and they can radiate at different wavelengths, just as in the fluorescence process I discussed earlier. So they can also radiate uh, in, in the ultraviolet and possibly even in the visible. However, most of their emission will be in the X-ray, in the X-ray. Now this feature at 560 electron volts happens to match precisely well, within the resolution. Uh, it happens to match uh, the, the main transition of O7 plus, that is oxygen with a single electron. Its principal transition is at 560 electron volts. So it's very persuasive to say, well, that's, that's what we're seeing. And then this feature at, uh, at 390 electron volts, that could be either carbon, a carbon ion with a single electron or nitrogen ion with a single electron. You can't really tell. We need higher spectral resolution to distinguish between them. There may in fact be two. That may be a, a, a composition of composed of two, 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 uh, two emissions. Uh, we need higher resolution to, uh, to actually distinguish between the, the two possibilities. Now, this capture process is, is a very interesting one. Uh, the electron can be captured by the positive ion into any of many accessible levels. And the distribution that results 
depends only weakly on the target gas and sensitively on the positive ion. So by looking at it, we can tell the nature of the positive ion, and we don't really need to know the nature of the target gas. The process happens to be very important as a diagnostic in high temperature fusion plasmas. So it's been the subject of many laboratory experiments in which the spectrum produced, the X-ray spectrum produced by ions uh, traversing a gas is actually measured in the lab. And unlike the solar wind, in the lab we can actually choose the ion and we can choose the gas. And so we don't know how to infer its proper, uh, the properties or the nature of the materials we know. Uh, we uh, ourselves make the choice. However, it does require the uh, production and control of species highly ionized species at velocities corresponding to the solar wind, and that is a considerable um, technical challenge. However, it has been done, and it can be used. There's a, another comet, Comet McNaught Hartley. Now, here, is, uh, here is an image, a not very clear image. Uh, I had said earlier comets are very large uh, objects. Let me emphasize that. This is a distance of 10 to the fifth kilometers. So here's the entire comet, certainly over a million kilometers in extent. Uh, here is the nucleus, and the, it's very, probably hard for you to see. But there is a kind of c crescent here. It is rather similar, and it points directly to, to the sun. This is Comet McNaught Hartley. Here is the spectrum. I'm sorry it's so, uh, so busy and not so easy to, uh, to understand, perhaps. But again, this is showing a spectrum, a much improved spectrum, much improved resolution. So you see many more features. That original spectrum was some sort of average of this. This goes from 200 electron volts to 1,000 1, electron volts again don't need to understand all of it. We, we can merely simply focus on the, on the blue curve, which is the, which is the measurement. So that is the new measured spectrum for, for this, um, uh, this comet we don't hardly. And what we'd like to do is to try to reproduce this spectrum using this model we have of positive ions coming from the sun capturing electrons from the, from the atmosphere and then, and then uh, uh, radiating. Now we can, we can do that because at least if we make some assumption about the composition of the solar wind, you know, we can use the coronal observations to say how much oxygen eight plus there is, how much nitrogen, carbon, and so on. So if we use those numbers and then we use the laboratory data for the individual ions and we put those together, we can actually make a prediction. We can say what we would expect if this mechanism is correct. And that's what we would expect is these dashed lines. And though that's not very close, especially of those of you with good eyesight can recognize this is a logarithmic scale, but it's nevertheless persuasive. I mean, the shapes are all right. The, the relative abundances are not. The magnitudes are not that, that consistent. There are features in the theory, in the model, that are not in the, in the measurement and so on. But nevertheless, one can, I think, uh, conclude with some certainty that the mechanism that this, we are seeing the solar wind ions capturing the electrons and radiating in the X-ray region. The mechanism, by the way, also explains the crescent-like shape. The interaction be between um, a positive ion and a neutral atom is, is very strong. I mean, just as soon as they collide, uh, the, this process will occur, this capture process occurs, and the radiation occurs. So we see it happening. And it doesn't happen again because uh, the ion is now one less charge. And so that same radiation will not appear uh, from it. So you would expect uh, a rather thin uh, a region of, of excitation. 
the ions in effect do not penetrate far into the into the atmosphere before the uh, before the emission the emission occurs now transitions do occur at other wavelengths I've been talking about the x-rays because they were the, uh, so unusual and there now seem to be no other mechanisms. But the that, that same process we're talking about of capture followed by decay also gives rise to radiation at other, other wavelengths in the, by the same kind of mechanisms. So a decisive test of this will, will come from observations of the cas so-called cascading transitions at ultraviolet wavelengths, where, where which have the advantage that high resolution is more readily more readily achieved. So some of these lines arising from the cascading may in fact be these uh, unidentified lines in this spectrum. This one, for example. And we don't actually know yet. That uh, is uh, research that is currently in progress is, to, is an attempt to identify these lines the unidentified ones, and see whether or not any of them uh, could be a result of this capture mechanism. So they could also be a diagnostic uh, of the uh, of, of the X-ray process. Well, given that the electron capture is the mechanism, we agree that well, that's how it happens. We can ask the question a little differently. Instead of doing this rather this comparison of uh, with some assumed uh, solar wind composition. Uh, we, we can instead ask, well, what should the solar composition be in order to reproduce the X-ray observations? So we answer that question. Now this is just uh, between 500 electron volts and, and 1,000 electron volts. And what I'm showing here is the model that I've been describing of, of but now with the, at our disposal, the actual abundance of the, of the ions, uh, O7 plus and O8 plus. It happens that between 500 electron volts and 1,000 1, electron volts, uh, only oxygen ions and neon ions contribute. This is the neon, which we can, can uh, ignore. This is entirely contributed by the oxygen ions O7 plus and O8 plus. The curve, the blue curve, is the, is, is the calculation that we do if we assume a ratio of, of three. And you see we sit right on top. The circles are the experimental values of that previous uh, spectrum I showed. It's the same spectrum uh, with the uh, data below 500 electron volts eliminated. So we get this exact match. So we would argue that that surely then this is tis the solar wind, and then we can in fact go to the uh, to the to the conclusion. Not only is it the solar wind, but we we know from it what is the actual relative abundances of the O8 plus the O7 plus. Well, given that, then one recognizes the solar wind must uh, interact in a similar way with other objects in the solar system. It's streaming out from the sun. It's going to hit anything that's in the solar system. Of course, comets are very large. They have a very large cross-section. But still, one, it is interesting to ask, what about the other components of the solar system, like the planets, uh, like Earth, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn? In all of those planets, in fact, X-rays have been, have been observed. They've also been observed in the Jupiter moons, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and also something called the Io uh, Plasma Taurus. Still, these objects, planets, are very small objects, and the moons are smaller still. So one would not expect to see uh, a very much in the way of, uh, uh, of, um, of X-rays. Right, this is uh, Jupiter, and these are X-rays. And what this uh, shows is that uh, this is an auroral phenomenon on Jupiter. This is occurring at the, at the two poles. So it's very like aurora on the planet Earth. And what this may have something to do with the solar wind, but it certainly is not the direct mechanism, because this is being produced by ions uh, plunging, uh, penetrating deep into, into the Jupiter atmosphere, uh, as, um, as indeed happens on, uh, on Earth. This is uh, Venus. 
in x-rays. This is Venus in x-rays, as the previous one was Jupiter in x-rays. And that uh, has a different shape. That almost certainly is just fluorescence of solar x-rays. As a process, I said it's not very efficient, but it, it, does, it can happen. And it, there it is on, uh, on, on Venus. Uh, the, uh, the Earth, um, and Mars for that matter, have what's called a geocorona. Uh, hydrogen atoms and, and helium atoms escaping from the Earth create a sort of cloud of neutral hydrogen and helium around, around the Earth, of several Earth radii in, in extent. So that hydrogen and helium is neutral and it's sitting there. Uh, it will also be, therefore, must be, must be a source of X-rays. But it's confused by the fact that there's a still larger source. And that's the interaction of the uh, solar wind with, the, uh, with the heli what is called the heliosphere. The heliosphere is the region around the sun occupied by the material of the solar system and bounded by the local interstellar medium. The interstellar medium contains ionized uh, material and neutral material. And the ionized component is excluded uh, from the heliosphere by the solar magnetic fields, but the neutral gas just flows in unimpeded. Actually, it's the other way around in the sense it's the Earth that is flowing through the interstellar medium. But you can imagine material from the interstellar medium is flowing into the, into the heliosphere where it will, be, uh, where it will uh, in interact with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the solar wind. Now, so there will be a source of x-rays uh, from this interaction. Um, sitting on Earth, it'll look as if it comes from everywhere. It will look as if it comes from the entire sky. So we would expect, if this mechanism were, were, were occurring, we would expect to see diffuse x-ray emission from the entire sky. Now the discovery of a, of a diffuse X-ray background in 1962 was a major event in astronomy, for which last year Ricardo Giacconi was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. It's been the subject of innumerable uh, scientific studies. The more energetic X-rays in this background, uh, that is X-rays with more than say energies of a thousand electron volts, have been attributed to extragalactic uh, uh, sources beyond our galaxy. And the softer X-rays, which is what we have here talking about, uh, appear to, uh, to arise in a, in a more local source, which is thought to be just hot gas in our galaxy. Hot gas produces X-rays. And now we, we uh, in this discussion, we have a new possibility. The solar winds in the heliosphere are certainly contributing at some level and they will look as if they were part of the uh, diffuse, uh, diffuse X-ray background. Also, the solar wind is not really a wind. It's more a light, a light breeze. Uh, other stars have winds that are as much as 100,000 times uh, uh, more and more intense. So the possibility emerges also that perhaps we could measure the composition of the winds of other stars not only, only, only the sun. Well, this research was begun in the expectation of learning something interesting about comets. It actually told us very little about comets that we didn't already know. But it does continue as an active program because it tells us something unique about stellar winds and their surroundings and possibly about the uh, diffuse soft, soft X-ray background. I thank you for listening to me.